There's a well-known saying that many Christians have used quite effectively in evangelism, which is that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, I would be the last to deny that, but I do notice that in this passage, it comes out rather differently. Jesus says, if you want to come after me, then what you've got to do is to say no to your own selves. Pick up your cross and follow me. And everybody who was listening knew perfectly well what picking up your cross meant. It meant you are going to be tortured and killed. And if we said that in our opening evangelism, I suspect we wouldn't have quite such an enthusiastic response. Of course, Jesus had done many things before then which had made lots of people want to follow him, so he had a following all right, but now this is where it gets really serious. And he's saying, actually, the way that God's kingdom happens is not by people simply having a good time, doing what they want, hoping that God will fulfill all their dreams for themselves. It'll come through them saying no to themselves. Self-denial seems to be the way to the ultimate fulfillment. Oh, there will be an ultimate fulfillment. Some people standing here, he says, won't experience death before they see God's kingdom come in power, which Mark seems to take as a reference to what happened after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. But there was suffering to come. And here is the challenge of the gospel always. I am in touch from time to time with friends and colleagues in other parts of the world. I think of one man who is pastor of a small church in a town in Iran and who emails me from time to time. And I hear his tales about what it's like following Jesus in that particular context. I have another friend who is about to go and minister in the Sudan to the beleaguered Christian communities there. And I hear what that's going to be like. And I think we Christians in the West often forget that for many of our brothers and sisters, and historically speaking, perhaps even most of our brothers and sisters are through time and space. This challenge of Jesus has been absolutely at the center of what following Jesus has meant. If you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life because of me and the message, then you'll save it. That challenge is perhaps something we need to hear afresh, not only in Lent, but as Christian churches in the comfortable West, as we think about Lent, but also think about our wider responsibilities. It is, of course, hard to say no, and those who manage to say no to themselves then often find another temptation sneaking up behind. Ooh, I've managed to say no, aren't I good? And the temptation to pride, which is the deadliest sin of all, is the one that then often trips us up. And so in the other passage that we were going to look at, in chapter 9, verses 30 to 37, Jesus talks about humility. And humility is what happens precisely when we're not thinking about ourselves, whether it's yes or no at all. We're thinking about God, we're thinking about God's world, we're thinking about other people, so that the focus simply stops being on us. And this is one of those funny things, you can't whip up humility by looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, am I being humble yet? That wouldn't be humility. Humility is something, as it were, that happens as a byproduct of what we find here. If anyone welcomes a child like this in my name, says Jesus, they welcome me. And if anyone welcomes me, it isn't me they welcome, but the one who sent me. We are to look at the little ones, the ones in whose lives and faces we may see a better reflection of the kingdom than if we look in our own. And then as we look at Jesus, who stands behind those little ones, we find ourselves looking at the face of God himself. And when we say yes to him, all the other questions, yes or no, will fall into their proper perspective.